So tonight we're talking about principle three, and our word and our acrostic are going to be action. And I'll say this kind of out of order uh, in my notes. Up until now, one, two, and three are very important steps. You're laying a foundation, you're laying the groundwork. In, in step one, you're admitting your powerlessness. So you are, you are coming to a realization of the truth about what you're struggling with, about why you're here. And how is that different from other times when you've admitted a problem? Well, the difference is you're allowing in the full knowledge of your condition. You're, you're saying, here are the implications, whether that's drugs, whether that is codependency, whether that is pornography addiction, whether that is uh, simply a habit, a way of thinking that you know is unhealthy for you. That has lifelong, ongoing implications of never getting better if something's not done. That's different than just saying to somebody you have a problem. So that's our step one. Step two is, right, that we, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves, whom we know is Jesus Christ, can restore us to sanity, to a place where we are making healthy, sound, good decisions for our life, the way God intended us to do that. That's not happening in step two. You're coming to believe that that can happen for you. Well, what are you, how is that going to happen? Well, that's going to happen by working the steps, by coming to celebrate recovery. And so three then is talking about making that commitment and taking and moving into action. So I say this every time this teaching comes around. I love the teaching, but no action's being taken yet. Everything up to this point has been internal between you and God, and it's been intellectual consent. And three is that jumping off place where done right, we can then move into action. So let's talk about action and what that means. So A is accept. So for those of you who like to fill that out, A is accept. We talked already about powerlessness. So the first thing we had to accept is powerlessness. If you want a definition of that word accept, it's to allow in or to let in the truth. That's the difference between admission and acceptance. Admission is just stating it. Acceptance is allowing it in. What's the second thing? Well, God. We're accepting God. We're allowing God in. So if we're allowing God in, what does that mean? What's the difference? Well, for those of you who are here, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm extremely distracted. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm distracted. I can't. That's all right. I'm just trying to, <laughs> if, if you don't mind. Um, for those of you who are here and don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's next. That's right now. Need to make that decision. Can't go any further with the steps. We can't go any further in this process if you don't first know who it is that's going to do this work in and through you. And that's Jesus Christ. So not only do we need to accept our powerlessness, but we need to accept that without God, apart from Jesus, we can't do anything. Right? So that's the next part of our acceptance. And the final part is accepting God's love. And believe it or not, I think for a lot of us, that's the hardest part. We can accept that we're not God. We can accept that we're powerless. We can accept that we're broken sinners, that we need Jesus. But can we accept God's love? Because a lot of us believe we know better than God does. You don't know how many people, part of my job as a care pastor is counseling. And I counseled for years before I became a pastor. And often, over and over and over again, I hear people's judgments of themselves. And I often will stop them and say, so you're smarter than God. And they said, I never said that. I wouldn't say that. I'm not saying that. I said, well, God wants to forgive you and love you and heal you. And you're saying that you're not worth it. So you're saying you know better than God. So I would challenge you if you're sitting here tonight and you struggle with that and you struggle with your worthiness. Do you really believe that you know better than God? Because God says you're worth it. God says, I died on a cross. I went to a tomb. I took all sin unto me and was raised again to defeat sin and death. And if you were the only person on the earth, I would have done it. There are other few implications. That means you would have been the person putting him on the cross, but that's another talk for another day. But the point is, he would do all that just for you. He did do that for you. Do you know better than God? So we're accepting our powerlessness, we're accepting God, and we're accepting God's love. The C in our action is commit. 
The first thing we're committing to is action. We're committing to taking the rest of the steps. You want to know what action we're talking about? We're talking about the action of the program. Every step from here on out will ask you to do something. And I want to stop for a minute and just talk about that because this has been a a present theme in my life for the last few months. Um, And one that I'm convicted by because even though I help people, I don't take all the actions I could to spread the gospel, to help people, to care whenever anyone's in need. That is what differentiates us. God says that that people will look at us and know we are His by our love for one another and the actions that we take. When you commit to this program and taking the steps, you're also committing to becoming a disciple of Christ. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Being a disciple is a whole lot more than putting a butt in a seat. That's great, but you can come and you can come and you can come to church and you can come to CR and nothing changes because if nothing changes, nothing changes. It is taking the steps and doing the actions prescribed therein that will bring about the necessary change. Does that make sense? So if I've seen people come, they do one, two, and three. They do a good job, but they don't go any further. And guess what happens? Eventually, they're back in their hurt habit or hang up. Because without taking the action, nothing's going to change. So we commit to action. We commit to seek God in everything. Matthew six thirty three says, seek ye first the kingdom. Well, it doesn't say seek ye first the kingdom once. It says, seek ye first the kingdom ongoing. Seek ye first the kingdom in everything that you do. Well, what does that mean? How do we define the kingdom? Well, I really like a a writer and theologian by the name of Dallas Willard. And Dallas Willard said, basically, God's kingdom is the effective reach of God's will. So anywhere God's will can reach is his kingdom. The difference between us and, say, an animal is that we make the decision if we're going to let God's will into our life. Are you going to be part of his kingdom by allowing God's will to reach in and reach you in your life? Are you seeking first God's kingdom in everything you're doing? What would God have me do? Is this the way God lives? Is this what Jesus would do? How would he do it? Let me ask. Let me pray. Let me counsel with someone at church. Let me ask my sponsor. Let me ask a trusted friend. Seek ye first the kingdom. So we're committing to action. We're committing to seek God in everything. And we're seek, we are committing to not quit until the miracle happens. And those of you who have heard this lesson before or heard me talk about this before, know that part of what I'm talking about is you won't know if your commitment in three took until you get to step 11. Let me say that again. You won't know if you really committed and meant what you said until you get to step 11. Because in three, your freedom is still a theory. Right now, if you're new, or even if you're in steps one, two, or three, The freedom that is offered in the 12 steps and getting closer to Jesus and allowing him in to expel your hurt, habit, or hang-up is still a theory. And I'm going to repeat this again later, but I'll say it right now. The spiritual life is not a theory. You have to live it. The spiritual life is not a theory. You have to live it. Okay, so I'll say that again. We're committing to action. We're committing to seeking God in everything, seeking first the kingdom. And, and committing to not quit until the miracle happens. All right, T stands for turn it over. And I wrote here, turn it over and release it. Right? Picture, picture you're holding on to something. And God goes, okay, Tom, give it to me. That doesn't do a whole lot, does it? We got to turn it over and let it go. God won't wrestle you for it. He wrestled somebody in the Bible. I guess he was done after that because he's not going to wrestle you guys. He's going to he's going to encourage you. He's going to love you and he's going to be patient with you until you'll let it go. So we're going to turn it over and we're going to release it. You know, I remember Jesus praying in and in Mark 1436. Right. What is God, what does Jesus say? He says, you know, I'd rather do it this way, but your will, not my will be done. That's really what we mean by turning it over. That's really what we mean by letting it go is we're surrendering our will to his will. 
we're saying, yeah, I really don't feel like doing this, or I'd really like to do this another way, or my feelings don't match what I know I need to do, but I'm going to surrender and do it anyway because I know it's your will, God, that I'm, I'm surrendering this to you. And the last thing I wrote there was letting go of control. And we've talked about that a lot in here. Um, my firm belief is that if there is one master addiction, it is the addiction to control. Because control gives us the illusion of security. And God says, I have all power. I have control. I want to be your security. So you're going to turn over the right to being in control to God. You're going to turn control over to Him. I It's only the beginning. I stands for it's only the beginning. Kind of talked about this already. We talked about the intellectual consent. But I wrote here also Proverbs 9.10 that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right? It's only the beginning. I'm going to say that again. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I hear people say that verse a lot and talk about it, and then they stop. Let me say it again. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Don't we want to increase wisdom? Don't we want to continue in wisdom? Right? It's only the beginning. Later in our Bible, 1 John 4, 18 says, Perfect love casts out fear. But wait a minute. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Perfect love casts out fear. So what does that tell you? It tells you that through a process, and I'm going to tell you you can get there through the 12 steps, we, we have to start with our right relationship to God. If you are not in awe of God, then you're worshiping the wrong one. If you're not in awe of God, you're worshiping the wrong one. Fear doesn't mean here that you're cowering in a corner under a rock. It means that you're on your knees in right relationship to God. That's what fear here means. But God doesn't desire to have that be the end of His relationship with you. And that's why it says perfect love casts out fear. Fear is the start of your relationship with God because that's the right place for it to start. Where it ends is in love. Where it ends is your, your, that God loves you and you know it and you accept it and you love Him. And then you go out and share that love with your neighbor. That's where it ends. That's, that's where wisdom leads. And that's the process of emptying out through the steps so that the love and grace of God can fill the empty vessel you just created so that it can bubble out to everybody else. But three is simply the place where we're starting that process. It's only the beginning. O stands for one day at a time. I've said this before, and I might get some people that, you know, I haven't gotten any hateful emails or anything yet. But God is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We know that. We know that He doesn't change. We know that He's ever-present. We know that He's all-powerful, and we know that He knows yesterday, today, and tomorrow all the same. But I don't. I'm finite, at least right now. I'll be in heaven someday, and then I'll be eternal too. But right now, I'm in this thing. And I go to sleep, and I, when I wake up, it's a new day, and that's the only place I inhabit. I only inhabit today. So if I only inhabit today, whether God's in yesterday or tomorrow doesn't matter, because I want to be where God and I can be together. Guess where the only place God and I can be together right now is? So the reason we say one day at a time is because if I'm in anywhere else, I'm in godless territory. And I don't ever want to be out of God's presence. I've lived that way already. It was bad. So I want to be in today. I want to be in the moment. Now, does that mean we don't make plans? Does that mean we don't think about the past and make amends and do the things we need to do? No, of course not. But it means that my focus needs to be in the here and now. Because when I am often yesterday or often tomorrow, I'm in big trouble. So we live, we live one day at a time. We live in today. But our serenity prayer says, enjoying one moment at a time. So we'll go one further and we'll say, if you want to be in the joy of the spirit, you got to be in the moment. You got to be with the people you're with, listening to them, paying attention, 
enjoying yourself and them for who you are. So we enjoy one moment at a time. We live one day at a time. We enjoy one moment at a time. And then I had to add the second part or the last part there, even though it's not an O, which is accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. What does that mean, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace? Well, we talk about trials leading to perseverance, perseverance to character, and character to peace. Right? Because it gives us perspective. And we're reminded that God's in everything with us. So we're accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. So O stands for one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, and accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. And N stands for next step. So what's the next step you're going to take? Maybe you need to get a sponsor. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you don't even know what I'm talking about. Well, a sponsor is a guide, and that person's going to guide you through the steps. But I want to stop and tell you something that I love about the 12-step program. We talked earlier about getting into action and really doing things. There are a lot of churches and a lot of church programs where you could show up for years and not do a darn thing. And they'd be happy to have you, drop a little money in the bucket, keep everything moving, oil the machine, right? That's great. You can do that. There's churches all over the place. CR is not a church. It's a program. And it's a program of action because we know that true discipleship is, do you know what it means to be a disciple? It means to imitate. That word means to imitate. So if we are disciples of Christ, we are imitating Christ. If we are imitating somebody or something, we're saying and doing the things that they did. We're trying to walk in the way they walk. Jesus said, I am the way. They used to call Christianity, Christians, the way. What does that mean? Well, that means the way is the action. It's how we're going. It's how we go through life. The 12-step program is one of the only true discipleship programs I'm aware of that actually says we're going to walk out what we're talking out. Okay, so it's all well and good for me to be up here and to talk to you about this. But if you don't move on with the action and do those things, then you're not an imitator. You're not a disciple. Well, here's the cool thing about the 12-step program. You go, well, I'm just getting to know Jesus. Or I don't even know what that means to imitate Jesus. Well, that's okay. Imitate your sponsor for a while. Imitate your sponsor for a while. Because if your sponsor has worked the 12 steps and your sponsor is living out what they say they're living out, then they're imitating Jesus. And if you imitate them, then you're imitating Jesus. At some point, your sponsor is going to look at you like mine did and said, you need to stop being so dependent on me and depend on Jesus. But they'll tell you when that time is right. They'll help you know that time. So this is a great sponsorship. So maybe the next step for you is asking somebody to be your sponsor. How do you get a sponsor? You ask someone. Maybe the next step is literature. Maybe you're sitting here and each week you hear these talks about the steps, but you don't have any of the literature from CR. Well, that would be a next really good step for you. Get a hold of that first step booklet and start reading it and going through it and filling it out. And maybe the next step for you is you're right squarely where we're at. Maybe you've been tracking all along and you're on principle in step three. So your next thing would be make sure you have a sponsor and get into step four and get into step four. So those are next steps. Last thing here, and this was, um, I'll talk a little bit about my sponsor and the relationship, but I was thinking about what is a working definition of care for our ministry and our church that we would like to tell people. So I'm going to read over this a couple times so that if you want to write this down and tell people this is how and why we care for people at Northside, you can write that down. And I said, care is the act of loving others. Care is the act of loving others to the point of personal healing and restoration where they are ready to be directly discipled by Jesus. Care is the act of loving others to the point of personal healing and restoration where they are ready to be directly discipled by Jesus. Yes. Care is the act of loving others to the point of personal healing and restoration where they are ready to be directly discipled by Jesus. Someone said it to me like this one time. God only has kids, not grandkids. Right? No big eyes and little U's in the kingdom. Nope. No big eyes and little U's. Doesn't matter. I'm, I'm a pastor. Big whoop. 
Just one of you. Right? Big and no big eyes and little U's. Everybody's a member of the kingdom. No grandkids, no great grandkids, just kids. Okay? Um, I was really fortunate, and I'll end with just talking a little bit about my first sponsor. I was really fortunate in recovery to get a very godly and very wise man as my first sponsor. And he was actually my sponsor for eight years. Believe it or not, I met with Rod every week for an hour for eight years. You really get to know somebody. You really get to be in relationship with somebody. And discipleship is about relationship. Not only being a disciple in the program and working with your sponsor, but also being a disciple of Jesus. You can't be a disciple of somebody you don't know and aren't in relationship with. And you can't be in relationship with somebody if you don't talk to them. And your sponsor might seem like the most spiritual person in the world and tell you they love everybody, and then the first thing they do is kick their dog when they get home. So you might want to go to their home and see what they do there. They say they love their neighbors, but their neighbors won't even come out and talk to them. Right? So we can all sound spiritual when we're just talking, but if you, if you want to find a sponsor and you want to move through and you want to be a disciple, get to know that person. Get to know that they're walking what they're talking. And then guess what will happen? You will trust them enough to the point that you will drop your defenses and you will share the things you need to share and you will do the things you need to do. And lo and behold, you're going to get better. But I was really fortunate to have that person. I can remember one time, um, and I was at fault, and I had done something I shouldn't do, and we ended up yelling at each other, and we both just sat there for a little while in his living room after we yelled at each other, looking at each other, and all of a sudden he spoke up and he said, thanks. I'm like, thanks for what? And he goes, thanks for being uh, mature enough and respecting me enough that we can get mad at each other and still be in relationship and still move past this and still that was the first time in my life that had ever happened with anybody that was with my sponsor and I can still remember the day and I shared this a little bit earlier where he looked at me and he said you don't need to call me all the time anymore I said what are you talking about he said you need to depend on Jesus he said you can always run stuff past me I'm always happy to support you and help you but we worship we believe in and we are led by the same God And he said, it's time now that you start trusting in him and taking your troubles to him. But it was after a long time of getting used to getting honest with somebody, speaking out those things that I didn't want to say to anyone so that I could learn to go to Jesus in prayer and say, I really messed up today, Jesus. I really don't know what to do. I really need you to guide me. I need you to forgive me. I need you to show me how I make amends for this. Right, But we learn that by working with one another. So get into action. Get a sponsor. Start taking the steps. Get in your Bible every day. Pray. And with or without your permission, you're going to change.